Hello, and thank you for listening to the final workshop in this series. This workshop will be focusing on preservation, conservation, and digitization, as well as troubleshooting. I've interlaced these two topics together throughout the presentation as troubleshooting overlaps so much with preservation, conservation, and digitization. What is conservation and preservation? Conservation is when special techniques and tools are used to help ensure the life and longevity of an item. During the process, the item will be inspected and analyzed and the process to fix issues will be determined so that continued use does not cause further damage. Preservation is when items are stored and protected in a way that helps to minimize any deterioration or damage, whether it be chemical or physical. So in other words, preservation is prevention of potential issues and conservation is dealing with those issues if they do occur. When do you want to start preserving your materials? Preservation is to start right away and this is doing what was talked about in the previous workshop, like ensuring everything is in the proper boxes and folders. By placing these materials into the proper enclosures, you are helping to protect them from dust and dirt, light, and excessive handling. All of these can cause damage to archival materials and can also speed up their rate of deterioration. Always remember, any act of preservation you do is going to be beneficial for your materials, so please don't feel like this is something that needs to happen overnight. As I have talked about throughout this series, different materials are going to need different archival enclosures. If you ever feel lost on what is the best storage option for an item, a lot of the archival websites will give short descriptions of the types of materials you want to store the item in question. I can also provide you guidance and will be providing my email and phone number at the end of this presentation. You also want to make sure that you are separating documents and photos as photos can sometimes emit chemicals that can be damaging to documents as well as other different mediums you may encounter, whether it be a trophy or a scrapbook. Another reason that we separate the mediums is because the different mediums can have varying needs. So by separating them, you will be able to focus better on the needs of the particular medium in the archival box. For example, if it is photographs in the box, you want to ensure that they have the least amount of light on them. So you would ensure that whatever shelf they are stored in sees the least amount of sunlight, as well as is the least affected by the lights in the room. You want to try and store all of your materials away from light, but the reason I focus on photographs here is because it can be argued that they are the most sensitive to light based on the dyes and chemicals used in them. Photographs are particularly important to store away from light because not only will they fade, but they will become brittle, in some cases yellowed as well. When creating your archive, I would suggest trying to use a room that doesn't normally see a lot of activity. For example, if you have a guest room that is only used a couple of times a year, you can probably store some of your materials in there. If you are extremely limited in space and you may have to get creative. <clears throat> if what you have is small enough then you could use the closet as the doors of the closet would help to ensure that light isn't getting to your materials as well as creating a smaller environment <clears throat> which hopefully will see less fluctuations in temperature and humidity. If you do choose to use a closet just make sure that there is nothing harmful to your collections being stored in it. For example, paint, house cleaners, cardboard boxes, any types of liquids, and other materials that fall into or within a similar category. If you are extremely limited on space, then there may need to be some creative solutions that need to happen to store your materials. This could be placing some bookshelves in different areas of your home to store the boxes on, or you could store some archival boxes on bookshelves and the rest of your materials in closets. If only portions of your collection are in archival boxes, I would suggest storing those on the bookshelf and putting the rest in the closet to protect from light until they can be moved into boxes as well. If you do choose to do this, then my one suggestion would be to try and really keep track of both temperature and humidity so that you can ensure there are not too many fluctuations. I will talk more about how best to keep track of temperature and humidity in just a little bit. I would also suggest, I would also suggest having a distinct section, having distinct sections in your inventory list. So that's very clear where an item is being stored. So for example, one overarching section could be bookshelf one, then closet, and you would list what can be found there under each section. If you choose to do this and have more than one bookshelf or closet that the materials are being stored in, I would try to label them clearly so that everything is easy to navigate. Another spatial element to keep in mind is to try and not put anything on the top or bottom shelves if you are able to spare the space. By not storing anything on the top shelf, you are helping to reduce the amount of dust the materials are exposed to and also the amount of water they are exposed to if where you are working has sprinklers and they go off. 
It also helps to stop exposure to light as having the tops and bottoms of the books covered will reduce the amount in the areas that are affected by light. By not storing the materials on the bottom shelf, you are helping to protect them in case of flooding and as the bottom shelf can be close to the ground from attracting the dirt and dust that can be carried on your shoes. If you are an institution that uses sprinklers, then it is highly recommended not to store your materials on the top shelf because it will be better it will better help to protect them from water that comes down, and the same with not storing them on the bottom shelf as it will protect them from the water that pools on the floor. If this cannot be done, then we'll talk about ways to remediate mold if you find that you are having any issues with it. However, most times, if it is a large amount of materials that have been affected, then it is best left to the professionals. While we are, we are still on the topic of bookshelves, I wanted to take a moment to talk about the proper ways to store books on the bookshelf. I know many of you are thinking, what is there to know? You just put the books on them. And trust me, with my personal collection, I am the same way. But like with everything else in archiving, there are a few things that you want to be mindful of. So what do you do if you have a book that is too big to fit onto the bookshelf standing up? Your last resort option is to put the book onto the shelf sideways so that it is laying on the spine. This is your last resort because that's puts pressure onto the spine, which going forward can then cause damage to both the spine of the book as well as the pages within it. The best solution would be to lay the book on its back so that its weight is evenly distributed and that no one spot is taking the brunt of the pressure. However, this is not always a valid solution as the best case scenario is to only stack one book and not to put anything on top of it. However, if necessary, you can st book, store books three high as long as you are mindful of the weight and size of the books and ensure that the weight that is on the bottom book isn't more than the weight of that bottom book itself. I would suggest laying only your most fragile and vulnerable books flatly. When possible, you want to store books of similar sizes next to each other so that larger books are not leaning onto the smaller ones, which could cause damage to them. By keeping like sized books together, you are going to stop leaning, which will put less pressure on the spine. By keeping them straight, the spine will stay stronger and the books will have to do less work to stay in place. If your books are really all different sizes, then the best case scenario is to try to put the larger books near each other and then books of smaller sizes near each other. What we are looking to avoid is having some books tower over others and then those books unfortunately start to act like crutches and take the weight off the larger book, which can cause the structural integrity of the smaller book to be ruined. When thinking about space and storing materials, you always want to remember that you don't want to be focusing, you don't want to be forcing anything onto shelves so that when it is time to get something down, it doesn't want to budge. This can cause bends in the material and it can cause them to weaken from too much pressure being on them. It can also cause them to tear as you try to force them out. If you do not have the space, then you must determine if it is necessary to keep. If there is somewhere else you can store them, or again, if there is an archive, you could potentially donate them, or different materials too. Archiving can sometimes be an uphill battle, battle so it must be remembered that everyone who is working on it is in it together and only wants what is best for materials. If your local archive cannot accept your materials, they may be able to lead you to another one that will be able to. Remember, if you are storing photographs horizontally, then you can store the boxes too high as long as you are mindful of the weight of the box on top. Books that have also been stored in boxes can be stacked if there is no alternative. Just ensure that the weight is evenly distributed and the box on top is never heavier or larger than the one on the bottom. I would suggest this as only being a worst case scenario or if you are really tight on space as books are much heavier than photos so they are causing more strain to those underneath of them. Just a quick side note while we are on the topic of bookshelves, is it is important to be careful about what kind of bookends you are using. You do not <clears throat> want any that can rust easily, have paint that will tip off easily, that have any elements that can poke into the books, and you want to ensure that they are sturdy. Bookends are also really helpful in ensuring that you are not overstocking the shelves, which will prevent materials from needing to be forced out. Ultimately, whatever wherever you decide to store your collection, there are a few things that you are going to want to avoid. You want to ensure that you are not storing them near any cleaning chemicals, paints, air fresheners, or anything else that emits any chemicals or odors. 
The chemicals that are being emitted from these substances can cause damage to your materials, which can lead to them deteriorating faster. You also want to set up a cleaning schedule for your materials of either once a week or every other week. With this, what you want to do is gently wipe down your materials to get the dust off and then gently dust the shelves if that's what they are being stored on and sweep the floor. This way you are helping to ensure that dirt and dust do not start to build up on your materials. There are certain archival cloths that should be used for this as they are anti-static and will also hold any dust within themselves and not spread them from item to item. While cleaning your materials, you also want to do a quick scan of the area and check for any cobwebs or anything else that might be an indication of any pests, as they do like to come inside as the weather gets cold and also in the spring and summer as well. Bugs can start to eat away at paper, so you just want to make sure that this is not happening. Other pests or bugs might start to borrow in your materials and can also start to cause them to get dirty. While bugs are kind of gross and not the best to talk about, they do need to be mentioned here as they do pose a threat to your archival materials. There are certain types of bugs that enjoy living in old papers and books. One example is book lice, which can appear when materials are stored away and not in active use. Another type of bug that is common in archival materials is silverfish. While both of these sound gross and pretty scary, at least to me, I would like to assure you that neither of them provide any risk to you or any pets you may have at home as neither of them bite humans or animals, nor do they have, nor do they really have much interest in us as we do not provide what they need to eat. However, neither of these types of bugs are those that you want to let just live in your home anywhere. While outside of your archival collections, you are able to place traps and other such items to destroy the bugs, within the archival materials, you are going to need to be a bit more careful with them. It is suggested that to help deal with them, you want to reduce the humidity in your house, so getting a dehumidifier for your home would be recommended. By drying it out, you are going to be taking away from the environment necessary for these creatures to live in without putting harmful chemicals near your materials that could destroy them. Just make sure that the dehumidifier is not kept close to the archival materials. You just want to make sure that you are keeping a consistent relative humidity between 30 to 50 percent because numerous fluctuations throughout the day can be just as damaging to the materials than the relative humidity being higher than the recommended percentage. The same is true when with temperatures and consistent fluctuations throughout the day can also cause damage to your materials. <clears throat> In terms of book lice, they are going to be extremely hard to see as they are very small and can be mistaken for dust. They will be brown, white, or gray. The name can also lead to, common, to the common misconception that they are eating your books, where in fact they are actually eating the mold that is in it. So if you find that you are having book lice issues, it means that you probably have mold and it would be best to seek out professional conservation help for your archival materials. They can be very hard to identify, so you want to make sure that you are keeping an eye out on your materials for any potential mold growth. You can freeze the materials to kill the mold, but I do not suggest doing this yourself. And if you feel like you must, try to find professional guidance, because if the freezing of the materials is not done correctly, then it can cause damage to your materials. <clears throat> However, please try to leave this to a professional, as they will know how to best get rid of the mold and the infestation as well. Book lice are attracted to damp and moist areas, so if you're experiencing them, it could mean that you have a leak or the humidity is too low. While taking care of getting rid of the book lice, you also want to make sure that you are addressing the issues that attracted them in the first place. As I mentioned previously, silverfish are another bug that could cause major issues within your archive. These bugs are silvery or brown in color and have three long tail-like appendages at the rear, and they also have scales which help them to get their name. They are known to run very fast and hide from humans, so sometimes you will have to look at the clues they leave behind in order to determine if you are experiencing an issue with them. These clues could be that the, there are holes, yellow stains, or scales in your materials. If the bugs die in your materials, then you simply want to brush them off. If possible, I would suggest doing this outside so that you don't have to worry about them getting anywhere in the area that you are storing your materials in. If you cannot do this outside, then I suggest doing it in a room that is separate from the collection so that you can just vacuum it all up at the end and it does not risk the bugs getting onto any of your materials as you wipe them off or, cl or clean up. If they leave any stains behind, then you can try to try getting them off with the archival eraser if they are not near any ink. Like we spoke of before, the erasers can also take off ink, so it is better to sometimes keep the stain rather than losing important parts of the materials you are trying to preserve. Remember to always try these erasers out on any 
in, on an inconspicuous area of the material in question to see how it interacts with it. Other remediations include ensuring that all possible entry points for these bugs have been blocked. If you find they are entering from an area of your home where there are no archival materials, then there is a bit more you can do in remediation. There are silverfish packs that the silverfish will eat through, and then they will ingest the poison in them. While these are useful for areas not near your collection, I hesitate to tell you to put them near your collection as it is possible that the chemicals in it could have a negative reaction. The chemicals in these are toxic, so if you choose to place them around your house, make sure you are keeping them out of areas with food where children can reach or anywhere a pet can get to. While this is not the nicest topic to talk about, I feel that it deserves mention because this is a real issue you could face, especially because a lot of the areas you will be working in or storing these materials in could be exposed if one was to attach itself to someone entering and then jump off of them. As I talked about in prior workshops, Light is always going to be an issue with materials because it causes fading. As a quick reminder, different ways to help combat it is by turning off the lights when the storage area for the materials is not in use, keeping the materials in archival boxes if possible, and keeping the handling of materials to a minimum when it is possible to do so. But I also wanted to go over some, go over some other techniques that can help you to reduce the amount of light your materials are getting. Other solutions could include getting blackout curtains, as these could, should stop any sunlight getting into the room and affecting your materials. These will also help to regulate the temperature, as the sun won't be able to heat up the room as much through these. This doesn't sound like a valid option to you, as you can't have the room you are storing them in that dark. You could get light filtering curtains, as this will help to reduce the amount of light entering the room, while still keeping the room brighter than blackout ones. The only risk with these is that you are exposing your materials to more light in the end. Another way to help combat the amount of light your materials are receiving if curtains aren't very feasible for your situation is ensuring that all of your materials are in archival enclosures as the boxes will help to reduce the amount of light your materials receive. If you are displaying materials and having dimmers to control the lights so that the materials are only being exposed to as much light as necessary. Another potential issue that you could run into that could be hazardous to your materials is temperature and humidity. Most materials like it to be a certain temperature and a certain humidity to be able to thrive to the best of their abilities. But what do you do if you can't control these separate from the rest of your home systems? In terms of humidity, you can purchase a dehumidifier if you find that the air in the space you are keeping these materials need to be drier. Fans just with these, make sure they aren't rotating around the room, which can sometimes cause papers to fly everywhere, or a seize can be used if you find the room needs to be cooler. Just make sure that you are regularly cleaning them so that they are not spreading dirt and dust all over the room. The best option is just to replace the filter every few months or when you start to notice that it is, old, that it is getting really dirty, as you may not be able to get all the dirt and dust particles out of the AC, which could be an issue. You will also want to do this with the filter and the dehumidifier. It can take time to find just the right combination of what you need to use to get the right temperature and humidity, so don't get discouraged if it takes you a little while to get it just right. Your materials have survived this long, so they should continue to survive barring any extreme circumstances while you find the best ways to protect them. For rooms that need to be warmer, you want to look for any areas that may be allowing for drafts and find ways to safely plug them in. For those of you who have Nest thermostats, it does track the humidity of the general area surrounding it. So this may be a good place to start to kind of get a feel for how humid your home really, your home usually runs. If the thermostat isn't in the room you wish to store your items, there are some pretty reasonable humidity and temperature readers out there. If you monitor for a little bit, it will allow you to see the average humidity and if you are getting any spikes in it. If you find that it is not the humidity level necessary, typically for archival materials, you are looking for the humidity levels between 30 to 50 percent and temperature to be lower than 70 degrees at all time. As times continue and you start to know the space, it will be easier to determine what the materials need in order to thrive the best. If you do not have a nest thermometer, there are temperature and humidity readers that you can purchase. If you do a quick search, a variety will pop up in varying price points on archival websites. If you're just placing them in the room, then you don't have to be as concerned with the archival nature as they're not interacting with the materials. Also, don't feel like you need to go out and buy the most expensive one, as you can just keep handwritten notes of the readings rather than having it store them for you. If you do choose to get one with batteries, though, just make sure that you are checking them every so often so that it doesn't die when you are trying to do a week's worth of readings or something like that. 
And always remember that archiving and protecting your materials is a continuous process, so please try not to feel overwhelmed or like you aren't doing a great job because even the smallest steps in the right direction will help to preserve your materials for a longer period of time. Before I get into conservation or digitization, I wanted to take a moment to show you what materials look like once they are conserved and digitized versus what they look like prior to conservation and digitization. Oftentimes, I think people have this notion that when materials are sent back, they're going to, be, to come back in the per perfect condition and in the same format that they were sent out in, that they were sent out in. They also have the idea that digitization will not accurately reflect the materials, especially the imperfections in them. On the next few slides, I want to show you a few examples of the materials prior to conservation and digitization. As you can see here, the pages are starting to come apart from the seam a little bit, as well as some browning throughout the page. On this one, you're going to be seeing some stains. And then here, you're going to see some more browning as well. And then right here, you're seeing a stain right on the ink, and then you have some marks here. As you can see, with the conserved and digitized materials, there are still a good amount of imperfections within them, whether it be rips on the edge of the paper or stains. As you can see right here, you can also see that they photograph the film like paper on top of it. And you can see that you can still see where there, the page has been taped, where there were chunks missing of it. You're seeing that they still kept the staining because it was over the ink. When it comes to conservation, conservationists will do what they can for materials without the risk of causing more damage. So for example, if they try to remove some of the stains you see, then they could also potentially remove ink, which would cause researchers to lose information and would therefore change how the researcher would interpret the record in question. So we spoke about conservation a little bit in the beginning, but what does that mean to you when you are interacting with your materials? So to everyone here, including myself, it is going to be taking to be taking up metal removing up metal paper clips, removing metal staples, and removing rubber bands when they come off easily and gently. Since we are interacting with a document in a way that physically changes it, this is how conservation and preservation differ. Conservation for, 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 for professionals is a bit different, and if you choose to send your materials to them, then there will be different ways in which they interact with them. One way they could interact with it would be to unbind your book. A reason they would do this is because the binding was too tight, therefore putting too much pressure on both the pages and the spine of the book. Having it too tight could also mean that the edges of the page near the binding are not legible. Other ways they may interact with your materials is removing any caked on dirt, removing rubber bands if it's safe to do so, or repairing tears. However, it is important to keep in mind that if you ever choose to get work done by a professional conservator, it does not mean your materials are going to come back looking brand new. A lot of times the materials come back looking very similar to the way that they left, as tears will, not only, as tears will only be fixed if it does not pose a threat to the materials in question. You may be thinking to yourself, is it not fixing the kit tear causing more of a threat to the materials? And the answer is not necessarily because a tear would have to be fixed with some type of material that enclosed it. If they are always in, and they are always hesitant to put it on as you can never know for sure how a material will react to it. Will the items always come back looking exactly the same after conservation? The answer is no, and that's because conservators will always do what is in the best interest of the materials. For example, I just showed you the images of the government records and you can see that even after digitization, there are still flaws in them. However, beyond that though, some of the record books came back unbound in archival folders and boxes. So you're probably asking yourself why this happened. One reason is that some of, these, some of the pages could have been sewn too tightly into the binding which puts increased pressure on them, which causes them to weaken over time, can make them hard to read, and could potentially cause tears in them. When you factor these issues in, then it makes sense to not risk putting the pages back into their original bindings, but rather keeping them loose in folders to prevent any further damage. There can also be issues with moisture and water with materials, which is one of the main reasons why it is suggested to not store materials in the basement, especially in this area where flooding can be a common occurrence. Mold is very 
is very much a conservation issue because you're now interacting with materials more than just providing it protection. If your books or papers get wet, it is important that they are dried as soon as possible. This should be done by freezing materials. However, for a bit afterwards, the temperature of the room should be paid attention to and kept a bit cooler because if it gets too warm, the spores could potentially activate, causing mold to grow. If mold does happen to grow in your materials again, the best course of action is to freeze them. There is a lot of information online on how to remove mold after it is frozen. It is a very delicate procedure, so if you do it yourself, make sure it is done outside, that you are wearing long pants and a long sleeve shirt, and mask, gloves, and protective eyewear to avoid the mold becoming irritant to you or getting into your body. However, I would strongly suggest keeping mold remediation to the professionals and seeking out professional help if you find that you are having mold issues. Mold is also very dangerous, which is why I also tell you to seek professional help. While you want to be protecting your materials, it is also important that you are also ensuring your own health and protection. If at any time you find that you need preservation work, conservation work done to your materials, I would suggest going to the Northeast Document, Document Conservation Center or the NEDCC, which is located in Andover, Mass. Another great thing about the NEDCC is if you go on their website, they have a lot of free materials that talk about preservation of different mediums, which can be very useful as refreshers or just to ensure that you are doing the right thing. At some point, you may find that you want to share these materials with members of your family that live out of state or if you are an institution with a consultant. There are some benefits to digitization that will be truly helpful to their original materials in the long run. One of the main benefits is that the original can now be handled less. Handling the original less means that there will be less wear and tear, which in theory means that the materials in question should survive longer for future generations. It also means that the materials can be stored away, which will help to reduce the amount of light that is reaching the materials. The other major benefit is that you are able to provide more access to the, these materials. For example, if you had a relative in Australia who is interested in family photographs, they will now be able to see them without worrying about any damage coming to the original, whether you choose to ship them or go to Walgreens or CVS and get copies made of them. If you decide to get anything professionally digitized, one of the main benefits is that it will not soften any of the damage that has been done to the material, so there will be no sense of losing what the original looked like in the end. The only thing that will be lost is the fail and weight of the original materials. There are a couple different ways to digitize your materials within the comfort of your own home or office. One way is to scan the materials. However, before choosing this option, there are a few things to consider. The main thing is to assess the condition of the materials in question. If you find there are a lot of tears, issues with the spine, or the materials feel really delicate, then it's probably not the best idea to scan these materials. It can be dangerous to put a lot of pressure on the spine as it can cause it to break. So if you are scanning a book, try not to push down hard onto the spine because over time this can start to cause the spine to break away from the rest of the book. And if you're just scanning one side of the book, make sure that you are providing support to the other half of the book not being scanned. The light from the scanner can also cause damage to materials that are already weak. If the materials are in good condition, then this exposure to more light than usual should not cause much damage to, if, to your materials, if any at all. What is really the risk when it comes to your materials and light is having them exposed to large amounts of light for an extensive period of time. It is that extended exposure which is going to cause the materials to fade and in some cases become brittle, which in turn which in turn hurts the structural integrity of the items and causes great damage. If you do choose to scan your materials, make sure that if the whole item does not fit into the scanner, that you are supporting whatever parts of the item that are sticking out. This will help to eliminate any unnecessary pressure from the other parts of the item. For example, if you are scanning a page of the book, then you would want to hold the other half up so that the spine is not taking the pressure the dangling half would be putting on it. And the same, same idea, it is also important that if you are scanning both sides of the book at the same time, that you do not put the cover of the scanner down. You do not want to put the cover of the scanner down because it will cause unnecessary pressure on your materials. So what do you do if you can't scan the materials, but you still want to be able to share them with others? The other option is to take photographs of the materials in question. Photographs help to ensure that there is not 
as much pressure being put onto spines because the book no longer needs to be pushed down in order to get a clear image. However, it must be mentioned that photographs not always provide the best quality pictures if you are doing it on your phone, as when they go in to zoom in, it may cause the image to be blurry. Also, there will be the issue of it not being keyword searchable like a PDF document would be. Like with everything else, the pros and cons of each method must be weighed in relation to the condition of the book. If you are unsure of what method you should choose, I would always suggest the photographs because it will always do the least amount of damage or potential damage to the materials in question. Well, we are on the topic of digitizing your materials. I also wanted to touch briefly on what you should look out for and do if you have any rails of film. If you have any rails of film and they start to smell like vinegar, it is important that you have them transferred to another format as soon as possible because if the deterioration continues, it will come to a point where you will no longer be able to use or even view the images in the rail of film. Another aspect of digitization that needs to be talked about is OCR. OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition and is a computer program that helps to make PDFs and other types documents readable by a computer so that they can be keyword searched. However, this is not necessarily something that you need to invest in, especially when you're first starting out. Oftentimes, if materials are typed and made into a PDF, they will be keyword searchable, so you can always start out by doing that in the beginning. From my understanding, they can also take PDFs and convert them into a Word document, which would allow you to then edit them. This could be useful if there is information you wanted to add at the end to make the material more understandable to some of the users. If you have a camera image of documents, it can be really hard for the OCR technology to pick up on it as they can sometimes have distortions that affect the OCR technology. This doesn't necessarily mean that technology won't work. It just means that you may have trouble with it depending on how powerful of an OCR program you get. There is also intelligent character recognition, which is similar to OCR, but instead of working to recognize typed documents, it works to recognize handwritten documents. However, because handwriting differs so greatly because everyone has their own style, it can have a very low accuracy. I have read that ICR is continually improving and that one of the main issues it faces is that the handwriting is, op that handwriting is often in cursive and does not have the defined spaces that type text does. Another aspect that I do not, do not think is too far away from the foreseeable future is having documents come into your archive in their original digitized format. Having materials originate in a digitized format also brings along with its own sets of challenges. For example, if it comes to you in a digitized format, then what is going to be the best way to create a backup copy with it? We can put it on an ex onto an external hard drive, which will preserve it as a second copy in case anything was to happen to the original. For example, it accidentally got deleted from the main system, it was on or the main system, it was on crash and it was not able to be retrieved. There is also the option to print it out. However, unlike when we go to, the, go to physical to digital, this does run the risk of the material not being represented in the same way. Digital documents can often be interactive. For example, they often let you click on areas which will cause something to appear or disappear in the document. While we can print out versions of both, the interaction will be lost to those using the paper version. This may be helpful by including this may be helped by including an explanation with the printout. However, in the end, you will have to choose what is best for your documents you are working with and the people who are using them. If you have family members that do not know how to use computers, then the print version may be the only way for them to see the materials unless they can find someone to help them with the computer. While not necessary, it does not hurt to have paper coffee, copies, and oftentimes the argument becomes that if one version is destroyed, then at least they have another to fall back on. For example, if your digitized versions become compromised and the file was destroyed by a virus, then at least you have the paper version, which is at the very least representative of the material. And then the same can be said if the paper document is destroyed in a fire that you will have the digital document to use if it was stored in the cloud or your external hard, dri hard drives were not destroyed. Though there are many benefits to digitization, it does not mean we get to overlook the drawbacks to digitization. One of the main drawbacks is that you really need to be keeping up with the changes in technologies. If any of you remember floppy disks or cassette tapes, you probably also remember the switch over to flash drives and CDs. 
As technologies change, we need to remember to switch over our materials from whatever technologies they are, that they are on so that they will be compatible with it, whatever new technologies we'll have to start to use. While this seems easy enough, it can sometimes be a challenge if you're focusing on many different things or if you have a large amount of materials digitized. The other drawback that some people will comment on is that the digitized version will never be the original. However, if you explain to them why you are presenting the materials in this format and that they are, aren't really losing anything other than the weight and feel of the materials, then they may be more understanding. Also, there are programs that I'm not super familiar with, but do know that they will create a flip book of your images. So if you have chosen to digitize a book, you would be able to get the software, which would allow the people you're sharing your materials with to digitally flip the book, which mimics the act of physically turning the page. One issue is how often is how over time the different types of technologies we use are going to become outdated and how we need to ensure that we are keeping up with these technologies and transferring records to ensure that they will always be readable. This doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out and buy these compatible technologies, but at one point where you, you are using will no longer work. And when you do go and get the new technology, your data will have already been transferred and made compatible with it. To try and counteract these types of these issues or as a type of backup plan, I do have a few suggestions that I think are very helpful as we continue to move forward with technology. I would also suggest having a copy of the material in your cloud, which is like an internet-based storage system that is usually connected to your email if you have a Gmail. And it's basically like the Google Drive, which you can use as an alternative. This just allows you one extra copy that can't be damaged by storms or leaks or bugs. As Even if you can't access it on your computer, you should be able to access it on a computer that you can use your email on. I'm personally a firm believer in the idea that it's better to have too many copies of something than not enough. And this is especially true when it comes to digital copies, as they don't take up a lot of physical space in the archive, as usually external hard drives can be very compact. What I would suggest doing is once a year checking to ensure that what you are storing your digitized materials on is still compatible with the newest system. This will be very helpful when your collections are being passed to the next person as they may not have access to older systems that would read the drive your documents were on before. One last thing I wanted to go over is de-ascensioning materials. And while I know many of you are individuals, this can be important for institutions. So what do I mean when I say de Deascension is when you take a collection or item out of your archival collection. This can be done for a variety of reasons, some of the main ones being that the material doesn't really fit with what you are keeping, you have too many copies of one item, or the material has been deemed no longer useful to the institution. Another reason that materials can be deascensioned, which isn't thought about often, is because they are damaged to the point where conservation and preservation can no longer help them. With certain materials like film and photographs, if they are damaged, then there is a risk that they can start to have a negative effect on the other materials within the archive, and so getting rid of one or two pieces for the benefit of all the materials is sometimes what needs to be done. With film and photographs, once they start to deteriorate, they can release chemicals, which can be dangerous to other materials in your archive. One way to still have a copy of them without risking the damage is to take a photo of it, and then you can print that out or keep it as a digitized version. If you are de something because you have multiple copies, then my rule of thumb, if space allows you to, is to always keep two copies of the materials in question. This way, if something was to happen to one, you will have another to replace it with. Also, if you have materials that have handwritten notes in them by people who are important to the institution, then you will want to save those because it adds added value to people who may want to use it. When you do this, you want to ensure that you create a record showing that the item was de -ascension. Keep this in your records and ensure that, in, that it, it includes the date it was deascension, who the deascension was approved by, if the materials were donated elsewhere, and where that place is. If it was a whole collection, I would attach a finding aid if you have one or offer a brief description of it. I always suggest asking local archives or historical societies if they are interested in your collection, especially if your institution does a lot with the community as it can help to represent the community dynamic of the time and this is very valuable. Also, while you have the space, there are other reasons that you may choose to de materials. For example, an alternative reason may be that you are having trouble maintaining certain materials that are very fragile or need special care. 
If this is the reason you are choosing to de ascension something, then I would suggest seeing if there is an archive nearby that specializes in the material or an interested local archive that you could donate it to. The last thing that I wanted to go over before the series ends is to talk a little bit more about retention schedules. As I know, I've touched upon them in previous workshops. As I said before, these will most likely be very useful for institutions, although there are ways in which they can help individuals as well. The first thing you're going to want to do is to see if your institution already has a has a retention schedule in place. If they do, then you're going to want to make sure that it covers all the materials you will be destroying or deascensioning at one point. And if it does not, then it is important that you update it to reflect them. Having a retention schedule that is written down will be helpful in keeping everyone on the same page as, as well as help those who are not familiar with any regulations about how long materials need to be kept, and they'll have a quick reference for it. If your institution does not have one, then the first thing I would suggest doing is seeing if there are any government or industry-related guidelines that you should be following. If there are guidelines that you will be able to build, build your retention schedule around it. If there are not, then it will be best to take a look at historically how your institution uses these materials and how often and for how long they are looked at. And this will help you decide how long you should retain them for. A retention schedule does not need to be anything super fancy. It could just be a table with the document's name, what type of info is found in these documents, where the documents are stored, and how long they need to be retained. But the great thing is that they can also be adjusted to your needs. So if you wanted to add more information, then you can just add another column or more to the table. Another great aspect about the record retention schedule is that in some ways it can help you organize your materials. For example, if you're just looking to store materials, then you can organize them together in such a way that any materials that need to be stored be destroyed in 2020 are together and then you only have to visit one section of your storage area and looking at everything individually. Of course, I would still double check the materials that are in the discard section just to ensure that they were properly placed. While archiving and records management have ways in which they do things and do have certain items that need to appear in certain types of paperwork, much of it is flexible in order for institutions to get the most out of it. Please feel free to email with any questions about the topics I went over or any questions about archiving in general, and I will be happy to answer them to the best of my ability. I would like to give a special thank you to the Gloucester Cultural Initiative for collaborating with the library on this workshop series and approaching the library with the idea. Thank you for joining this workshop, and please do not hesitate to reach out to me with any questions you may have in the future. On the next slide, you're just going to see a list of the different references that I use. Thank you again for listening and I hope you have a great day.